Well, good afternoon, church. Afternoon. Uh, Such a wonderful song to lead into the Word of God that we're going to open to today uh, here in Acts chapter 14, where we're going to talk about uh, telling the world that we are Christians, namely telling the world about our Savior, Jesus Christ. I want to thank you for joining us today, and, and, uh, and, and I'm really excited to have us consider Acts chapter 14 today, where we'll find ourselves being, because it is within Acts chapter 14, specifically in verse 1 to 7, that I believe that God's Word is going to lead us to a greater faithfulness and even a, a greater encouragement to continue to tell the world that we are Christians, namely that we will be more faithful witnesses uh, wherever it is that our Lord ends up leading us to, whether it is here in Hollywood uh, or wherever He sends us to wherever he leads and we go, we will tell the world that we are Christians. And so if you will, please turn with me to Acts chapter 14, verse 1 to 7 today, where we will learn about uh, the Apostle Paul and also the Apostle Barnabas as they themselves are finding themselves continuing in the work of evangelism that they themselves have been called to. Again, in Acts chapter 14, verse 1 to 7, we read of Paul and Barnabas at Iconium. And it says, Now at Iconium they entered together into the Jewish synagogue and spoke in such a way that a great number of both Jews and Greeks believed. But the unbelieving Jews stirred up the Gentiles and poisoned their minds against the brothers. So they remained for a long time, speaking boldly for the Lord, who bore witness to the word of His grace, granting signs and wonders to be done by their hands. But the people of the city were divided. Some sided with the Jews and some with the apostles. And when an attempt was made by both Gentiles and Jews with their rulers to mistreat them and to stone them, they learned of it, and they fled to Lystra and Derbe, cities of Lyconia, and to the surrounding country, and there they continued to preach the gospel. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day that we have to come together now to open to your word and and to be able to be encouraged by you, God, as you lead us to conviction of of just the conviction that you led to both Paul and Barnabas to have, a conviction to share your word wherever it was that they themselves would go. God, we know that you have called us to tell the world that we are Christians, and, and we also know that in the calling that you have given to us, you have also equipped us to do just that, giving us your word and leading us by your Spirit to be able to be bold witnesses for the Lord Jesus Christ. I pray, God, that today, that as we come through this passage, that you would lead us to a greater boldness, a greater willingness, a greater faithfulness uh, to be uh, presenters of the good news of the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, in order that many would come to know the blessed hope that we have found, which is salvation by grace through faith, and not only the salvation that you have brought us to, but also the eternal life that you will bring us into at the, final, at the final day, Lord, when you draw us to yourself and we are with you for all of eternity. God, as we await that day, make us your faithful witnesses to bring many, many into your kingdom uh, through faith in your Son, Jesus Christ. It's in his name I pray these things. Amen. Now, our immediate question upon opening up to Acts chapter 14, verse 1 to 7, is why in the world were Paul and Barnabas in Iconium? What is with this small little city, Iconium, that that Paul and Barnabas found themselves, well, spending a great deal of time presenting the gospel there? Why were they in Iconium? Well, if you look back to Acts chapter 13, verse 50 to 51, we read that as they were in Pisidian Antioch, the Jews incited the devout women of high standing, and the leading men of the city stirred up persecution against Paul and Barnabas and drove them out of their district. But they shook the dust off from their feet against them and went to Iconium. And so, as would often happen within the preaching of the gospel, they would receive some positive reception, but more than likely, they would also receive some uh, 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 rejection, rejection which would often lead to them being beaten and having to flee from their lives. And in this case, they had to flee from Pisidian Antioch and uh, head down to Iconium uh, in order that they would be able to escape the persecution that they found themselves to be in. Now, as we consider the fact that they were in Iconium because they were fleeing for their lives, the second question would be then, what is their purpose going to be as they enter into Iconium? Would they be there to uh, change the politics of their day, or would they be there to uh, bring about some social social change, or were they looking for some work until they could get back into Pisidian Antioch? What was the purpose for the Apostle Paul and also Barnabas to be in this city of Iconium? Well, to that, we would only need to understand the context of the book of Acts. Uh, As we look through the 
book of Acts, what we often see Luke presenting to us as we consider the passages is the gospel is being brought forward wherever these people find themselves to be in. In the early days of the church, when they were scattered as a result of persecution, the towns in which they went into, their purpose, at least as they saw it, their purpose in being in those towns was to preach the gospel message. And so we can bet that as Paul and Barnabas find themselves in Iconium, that they are going to preach the gospel message. But then as we consider this, we must have a third question that we ask. This begs this question of us. Would they not become exhausted in such a work as this? Would they not become exhausted in such a work as this constant repetitious behavior of going to a city, preaching the gospel, getting some positive reception, but mostly negative, getting beaten to the point they have to flee for their safety, going to the next city, and just having this repetitious act continuing all over again? Would they not grow tired? Would they not grow exhausted? Both, physic, both physically and mentally at this constant, constant repetitious behavior of having to flee from their lives from city to city. Now, we can imagine that we're going to be able to answer that question today, otherwise I would not have presented it to you. But before we answer that question, what I want us to do is to consider the fact that often it is the case that we are going to see within evangelism a repetitious behavior which centers in the fact of we're going to share the gospel, people are going to either receive the gospel or reject the message that we give to them. Upon doing that, then we'll stay there for some time and the person may receive us a little bit longer or the people who reject us will end up beating us until we leave from there place, and maybe not physically, but certainly mentally, they'll tell us to leave them alone or to get away from them, and then we have to go to the next person or the next town or the next place to continue this continual cycle, the same song, just a different verse. We preach the gospel, we're received, we're rejected, and we go on to the next place to do that again and again. This is a tiresome, tiresome behavior, certainly on the mind, which could often lead us to have a faithless witness in evangelism, namely that, well, we just don't want to keep being rejected, so we might as well just stop proclaiming the gospel altogether. But you see, this cannot, this cannot be. This cannot be. We cannot stop preaching the gospel because it is what God has commissioned us to do. I'm sure that as you have been evangelizing throughout your day-to-day lives or just telling people that you are a Christian, you often have these mental gymnastics that you play in your mind as you're leading into seeking to share the gospel with someone. What I mean by this is you're asking yourself a number of questions, and these number of questions maybe will be something like, well, what if they don't respond to the message, or how do I lead in with the gospel message, or how do I lead them to be able to see that the gospel message is truth, or, or what if they don't receive the message as I give it to them, or, or what if I could be more effective in sharing it this way or that way or the other way? Now, after asking yourself so many questions, really the question you should ask yourself is, why am I talking to myself? I should be talking to this person here, but the reality is, is we end up talking ourselves out of sharing the gospel with that individual due to the mental gymnastics that we find ourselves playing. We are often talking ourselves out of evangelism when the reality is, is God has called for us to be bold witnesses to proclaim the good news of the gospel of His Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. We must always be ready to share a reason for the hope that we have, the hope that is in our Lord Jesus Christ. In 1 Peter chapter 3, we are commanded of this. He says, always be prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you, yet do it with gentleness and respect. You see, as we come to this passage today here in Acts chapter 14, what we're going to be able to understand today is how we can continue in the face of the opposition and what merely seems to be a repetitious opposition, how we can avoid the burnout that comes with evangelism, and instead of being burned out for evangelism, being on fire to take the gospel message to whomever it is that comes our way. And so in the first thing that I want us to see from this passage is something that I've mentioned just briefly, but, but, but that which I want to touch on a little bit more, and that is that evangelism often produces the same results. When we evangelize, we're often going to notice that the results are going to be the same. And it often goes like this. You go to someone, you take the gospel message to them, you proclaim the message to them, and then they have an opportunity to respond. Upon their response, you have one or two responses. They either receive you by asking you more questions, or they repent of their sins and place faith in Christ right then and there, or they reject you. They may reject you verbally and say, nah, I'm 
not really interested in that, or, or they may reject you physically and say, you know, get away from me before I punch you in the face. And a number of different uh, results might happen, but generally speaking, as you share the gospel, you're going to have some positive response and also some negative response. Then as that, then as that happens, you then, you know, kick the dust off, take the dust off your feet as the Apostle Paul and Barnabas did, and you move on to the next person where this vicious cycle continues over and over and over again. First you preach the gospel, then division is produced with some believing and some rejecting, and then you go on to the next place to continue to take the good news to the Lord Jesus Christ. And this is often the case. There may be some differences in our evangelistic endeavors, but generally the case is that we will preach the gospel, we will be received or rejected, and then we will have to go to the next town. Now, I'm not saying that this is a positive or a negative thing. It's not positive or negative whether or not we're rejected or received. All I am saying is that we must expect the results that come from evangelism as often being the same. Over and over and over again, there is going to be this repetitious behavior that we should expect to happen as we take the gospel message to the ends of the earth. And this is what is happening here in Acts chapter 14, verse 1 to 7. This continuous theme that is presented throughout all of the book of Acts is really on display here in Acts chapter 14. Now, before we open up to look exactly as how this is going to go to play out, what I want us to see is this is a trend that is throughout the book of Acts. I don't want you to just think that this is a one-off situation where they preach the gospel, some receive, some reject, they're beaten, persecuted, forced from the town, and having to go to the next place. This is often the theme that God's Word presents to us that we should expect when it comes to our evangelistic endeavors. And so in the first, if you go back to Acts chapter 3, and in Acts chapter 3 we had the apostles as they were entering into the temple, and they found this, blind, this uh, lame beggar who had been lame for a number of years. They heal this man, and upon healing this man, it gr- gathers a large crowd. And when this large crowd gathers, uh, Peter opens his mouth, and he proclaims the gospel message to the people as they are in that temple. And as he's proclaiming the gospel message to the people, a number of people gather around them, and you can imagine that some receive it well while others reject it. And it gets to the point where Peter and John, who are there at that time, have to make a decision as to whether or not they're going to stay or go lest they become arrested. And so they decide to stay, and in turn they are arrested. They're persecuted. And and we read of the rundown of all of it in Acts chapter 4, verse 1 to 4, when it says, as they were speaking to the people, the priests and the captain of the temple and the Sadducees came upon them, greatly annoyed because they were teaching the people and proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. And they arrested them and put them in custody until the next day, for it was already evening. But many of those who had heard the word believed, and the number of the men came to about 5,000. Now, later, as you go throughout Acts, in Acts chapter 6 and Acts chapter 7, we see another evangelistic endeavor being partaken of by Stephen. Stephen was one of the seven who were chosen to help the widows as the widows felt that they were neglected in the daily giving of the food and also of the offerings. And so Stephen was chosen by Uh, chosen by the church, and he was going to serve in the form of a deacon. He was going to serve the church. Well, in serving the church, he also was a faithful, faithful proclaimer of the gospel message. And so what he would do is he would go into the synagogues surrounding the city of Jerusalem, and he would preach the gospel there. And as he would preach the gospel there, you can imagine as the theme is presented throughout all of Acts, he would preach the gospel. Some would receive and some would reject him. Persecution would inevitably come, and then he himself was faced with a task whether to flee or to stay in order that he would be able to continue to keep the gospel message going. And if you were with us during that time, you know that in Acts chapter 7, Stephen was not able to flee, but rather Stephen ended up being the first martyr. In Acts chapter 7, verse 54, it says, Now when they heard these things, they were enraged, and they ground their teeth at him. But he, full of the Holy Spirit, gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. And he said, Behold, I see the heavens opened, and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. But they cried out with a loud voice, and stopped their ears, and rushed together at him. Then they cast him out of the city, and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their garments at the feet of a young man named Saul. And as they were stoning Stephen, he called out, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And falling to his knees, he cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. Now, you can imagine that this theme is going to continue, as I've said it will, and if you turn to Acts chapter 9, Acts chapter 9, you see Paul, who was called Saul back in Acts chapter 7, now being converted and taking the gospel message to the ends of the earth, as he had been called to do so. And in Acts chapter 9, uh, around the uh, 
21st verse, he ends up finding himself in Damascus. And as he is preaching the gospel there, people reject him. And in order that he would be able to escape having the same uh, result of what happened to Stephen happened to him, he was lowered down out of the city wall through a basket, and he escaped uh, back to Jerusalem, and he met with the apostles there. Now, you're saying to me, this theme is often presented, but why is it presented? Why is this theme presented here throughout the pages of Scripture? Well, I believe that God is giving all of us a warning to take heed of, to know that when we seek to share the gospel message, the results are going to inevitably be the same, but in spite of that, we are to continue to press forward, trusting in Him and not allowing for the mundaneness that often happens within evangelism to prevent us from being faithful witnesses to the Lord Jesus Christ. To not allow for the mundaneness that often seems to happen as you are just going from person to person seeking to share the gospel with them to prevent you from continuing to take the gospel message forward. And on top of that, not allowing the opposition that you face to prevent you from taking the gospel message forward. Just last week, if you were with us, you know that in Acts chapter 13, that Paul and Barnabas had to escape from Pisidian Antioch because of the opposition that they found themselves faced with. They had to flee from that city as they were beaten on their way out, uh, probably whipped and and had the shoes thrown at them and and just a number of different uh, tools and methods to get them to leave that city because the people grew tired of their message as they continued to present the truthfulness of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. They were continuing to proclaim the gospel message in spite of what might come their way. And so there we have it, preaching, we have the preaching, we have the reception, the rejection, the persecution, and the flee to safety. And as we come back to Acts chapter 14, we're going to see that this is the common theme, the common denominator of the evangelistic endeavors, and this should lead us to a question. A question, would not this become tiring? Would not this become so tiring that Paul and Barnabas would have said, well, maybe we should start doing something else, or maybe we should leave this evangelism to someone else? So, you know, this is kind of tough work. We've got a number of different difficulties coming our way. People are always rejecting us. We should be just doing something better off for ourselves. This is the question, this is the temptation, really, that all of us will be faced with as we find ourselves faced with the continuous nature of our our evangelistic endeavors where we preach, we are received or rejected, persecuted, and then having to flee to safety or to flee to the next individual to see this process continuing over and over again. Now, again, I want us to see this here in Acts chapter 14 to lead us into the two, the two truths in which we can have as the forefront, at the forefront of our minds in order that we would not allow for burnout or the fear of opposition to prevent our witness. You see in Acts chapter 14, starting in verse 1, We read, now at Iconium, they entered together into the Jewish synagogue and spoke. And so, as I've mentioned, as would often be the case, Paul and Barnabas, they enter into this new city, and they go to preach the gospel. The first thing that they do every time they go into a new city, they're not looking for work. They're not looking to change the society or the culture. They are looking to preach the gospel and allow for God to do the work of the changing of the transformation of the hearts of these men and women who, at this point, are living a life full of sin. They are allowing for God to do that work. Their work is to preach the gospel. And so, they enter into this Jewish synagogue as they would often do, and they look for an opportunity to speak. And as often would happen, the Jewish rabbis in the synagogues would allow for anyone to stand up and proclaim a word of encouragement. And so Paul and Barnabas are given the opportunity to do this. And as we read in verse 1 and also in verse 2, a great number of both Jews and Greeks believed, but the unbelieving Jews stirred up the Gentiles and poisoned their minds against the brothers. And so, again, you see this theme. They've preached the gospel. Now, what do we expect to happen? Reception and rejection. Immediately this happens. A great number of both Jews and Greeks believed, but the unbelieving Jews stirred up the Gentiles and poisoned their minds against the brothers. In this case here, as we see it happening, as it's unfolding before us in verse 2, the opposition that they are faced with is not immediately from the Jewish, the the unbelieving Jews who are often the culprits uh, instigating the opposition, but rather it was the Jews, the unbelieving Jews, who were poisoning the minds of the Gentiles to draw the Gentiles away from responding to the faith. This opposition that I've mentioned will often come in many different forms, and in this case, 
In this case, the Gentiles were persuaded by the unbelieving Jews to flee from the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ and to try to move Paul and Barnabas to the next town. And evidently, this works because in Acts chapter 14, verse 5, it says, when an attempt was made by both Gentiles and Jews with their rulers to mistreat them and stone them, the apostles learned of it, and they fled to Lystra and Derbe, cities of Lyconia, and to the surrounding country. You say, why does the persecution happen? Why should we expect to be persecuted when people don't want to hear the gospel message? Well, the reality is, is because if they don't want to hear the gospel message, they want to remove the person who is proclaiming the gospel message from their midst. And so in order to get us to leave, often it is the case that they will result to force. They will try to beat us out of their presence in order that we would stop proclaiming the gospel message because they are vehemently opposed to the gospel message. And this is what happens here with Paul and Barnabas. They are getting to be to the point where they are having the, 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 the townspeople, that is, has murder on their mind. They want to kill Paul and Barnabas because they are tired of hearing the gospel message. They want to stone them. They want to mistreat them and to stone them. And stoning was a form of Jewish execution that would happen to blasphemers. And so Paul and Barnabas were seen as blasphemers for preaching the gospel message. And so here you have, again, this theme, preaching, reception, rejection, persecution and then a fleeing to safety. And then again, this process just starting over and over again because in Acts chapter 14, verse 7, it says, when they got to the cities of Derby and Lystra, they continued to preach the gospel. How tiresome must this have been for them? How tiresome must this have been for them, both physically and mentally, this constant anguish of knowing that when they are going forward with the gospel, they are going to be received, but they are also going to be rejected, and yet even in that rejection, they are to continue to take the gospel message to whomever it is that would be willing to hear from them. How tiring must this have been, the daily awareness of man's rejection, not only of them, but also so against God. How tiresome would this be for you? Put yourself in their shoes. How tiring would it be for you to go and share the gospel, to be rejected, to be forced away from that person, knowing that you just had to go again and again and again? Well, the reality is, is that should be our lives as well. Our lives have been, have been commissioned. We have been commissioned by God to go forward with the gospel message in spite of what might come. And, and really, the tendency for us as Christians today is to avoid evangelism because we know that this is what is going to happen to us. We avoid being bold for the faith because we know, we know that people are going to reject us. You see, people, as you put yourself in these uh, people's shoes here, someone might say, well, if they know this is going to happen, why don't they just stop doing it? Why not just stop evangelizing? If they know they're going to be rejected and be and why not take up another cause where people will be more readily available to receive them? Or someone else might say, well, okay, they have to continue to evangelize, but why not change up their message? Why not make the message more appealing to the people in such a way that they would receive them rather than reject them for proclaiming the gospel message of the Lord Jesus Christ? Now, these are two good suggestions, two very good suggestions. You don't want to be persecuted? Stop sharing the gospel. And secondly, if you uh, don't want to be persecuted while still sharing sharing the gospel, change the message. That's what often happens in the Christian church today. But you see, this is to the detriment of the gospel message itself, because if we stop sharing the gospel, man will not hear the message in which they need to receive the salvation which God has made available through Jesus Christ. And if we switch up our methods in how we proclaim the gospel, man is never going to be able to hear a God-centered gospel. Rather, they're going to hear the man-centered gospel, which is centered on health, wealth, prosperity, and everything else people are seeking in the world today. You see, the fact is, is that Paul and Barnabas could not stop sharing the gospel. And on top of that, they could not change up the message of the gospel because to do that would be to be disobedient to God and disobedient to the gospel message. They could not stop sharing the gospel. They had need to press forward despite the mental and physical exhaustion that they would face along the way. You say, how could they do this? How could mere men endure such physical Exhaustion, exhaustion and mental exhaustion every single day as they took the gospel message to the ends of the earth. Well, we're going to answer that. Before we answer that, I want us to recognize that if we find ourselves engaging in the habits of both Paul and Barnabas, we too are to expect this physical and mental exhaustion to come our way as we take the gospel message to the ends of the earth. Because as it is, people are still opposed 
to the gospel message. People are still rejecting the gospel message, very vehemently so, strongly opposed to the gospel message in such a way that we should expect to face persecution as we faithfully bring the gospel message to our friends or to our family members or to our neighbors or whomever it is that the Lord lays upon our heart to bring the gospel message to them. There's a believer who is over in uh, the Muslim world in the Middle East by the name of Johar. And this man was once an, uh, a Muslim, but he has since converted to Christianity. And he has a large family unit, a family structure in which he has lived his whole life under. But upon telling his family that he was a convert to the Lord Jesus Christ, and in turn of telling them that he was a convert to the Lord Jesus Christ, seeking to convert them to Christianity, he was rejected by his family. And this rejection was initially just taunts, and it was initially just a a verbal rejection. But as it was, as he continued to share the gospel message with his family members and with his friends, he found himself being rejected physically by them. He was one day abducted by both his father and his uncle, and they took him into a building, and they beat him, and they shot him with a nail gun. And as he was able to escape to a safe house, he now lives today finding himself utterly alone, away from everything he once knew, because he is a witness for the Lord Jesus Christ. How is this man to continue on? Everything he has known, he has lost. His family members have abandoned him. He has no livelihood. How is this man to continue to take the gospel message in spite of the opposition that might come his way? You see, this is something that not only happens over in the Middle East, but happens in our day as well, too, here in the United States, certainly not to that extreme. But if you were ever to come with us up to Hollywood Boulevard, you would notice that you would face some opposition yourself, often not to an extreme case. But there was one time when we were up there sharing the good news, and there was a gentleman who we sought to share the gospel with, and initially the conversation started out fine. But then this man stood up and told us if we didn't leave his place, he was going to punch us in the face. He stood up, and he was ready to go. He was ready. He was ready to fight us. And so we're, you know, we start walking away because we're not wanting to get punched in the face. You know, God can, God calls us to flee if we need to flee in order that we would live to share the gospel another day. And so we continue moving on down the boulevard and another person who saw the event happen, he's like, you guys better be careful. You're going to get yourself beat up out here. You know, how is it that that event happened somewhat about a years, a year and a half ago? How is it we're still able to go up to the, to the boulevard to share the gospel? How has that not uh, made us so fearful that we don't go up to to share the gospel anymore? How do we overcome the opposition and the burnout that often comes with the redundancy of evangelism? Well, there is two things, two things that we can notice from this passage as we learn how the Apostle Paul and Barnabas are moved forward, move forward with these truths. The first truth, the first truth that moved them forward is shown to us in verse 3. It says, So they remained for a long time, speaking boldly for the Lord, who bore witness to the word of His grace, granting signs and wonders to be done by their hands. The first truth that we must notice that the apostles had as they were continuing, take, continuing to take the gospel forward is that God was with them. God was with them. Now, this is not to suggest that God is not with us when we are not evangelizing. It is only to emphasize the fact that when we are evangelizing, when we take the gospel message with us. God is with us. God is with us. The creator of the world is with us as we take the good news to the ends of the earth. And not only is He with us, but as we see here in Acts chapter 14, verse 3, He is also supporting our work as we go about sharing the good news. He is supporting the work of the gospel presentation that we ourselves are doing. And in this case, He was supporting both Paul and Barnabas as He was enabling them to be able to do signs and wonders in order to witness to the fact that this was His Word. And as we ourselves go out and share the gospel message, God has given us spiritual gifts, spiritual gifts in which He has given us in order that we would be able to proclaim the gospel message in a powerful way, in a powerful way that will lead us to be able to say the right words in which we are searching for that we often think we won't come to find as we go to share the gospel. But then when you're out there sharing, you're saying, well, I don't even know how I said this. I just was moved to say this to this individual. God is with us. He is approving of the work that we are doing, and He is supporting us in the work that we are doing as we are taking His gospel message to the ends of the earth. You see, the fact that God is with us is the truth. It is the truth that is the antidote which prevents any burnout or any fear of man that would lead us from sharing the gospel message. It has always been the case for God's people that this is the truth that moves them forward. The fact that God is with them gives His people boldness to do His work 
as God commissioned Joshua to lead his people into the promised land. In Joshua chapter 1, verse 9, we read, Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be frightened and do not be dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. And now if you read the rest of Joshua, you know that they were able to enter into the promised land as God was with them and conquered that land for them. He went before them as the mighty warrior to bring them into the promised land he had given to them. Also, we read in Isaiah chapter 43, 1 to 2, God promised Israel he would always be with them. It says, but now thus says the Lord, he who created you, O Jacob, he who formed you, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they shall not overwhelm you. When you walk through the fire, you shall not be burned, and the flame shall not consume you. You see, God would always be with his people and he has promised to always be with his church. In Matthew chapter 28, verse 19 to 20, the Great Commission, when the Lord calls for his church to go forward and to be his witnesses to the ends of the earth, notice what it says in Matthew 28, verse 20, and behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. You see, we don't have to guess, we don't have to wonder, we don't have to hope that Christ will be with us as we share the gospel message. We can know that God will be with us because he who has promised is faithful to his promises. God will be with us as we take the gospel message to the ends of the earth. And you say, well, how intimately close is God with us? How close is God with us? Is he following behind us? Is he going in front of us? Is he above us? Is he beside us? Will he show up when we really need him? How intimately close is God God with us. How close is God with us as we share the gospel? Well, He is so close. He lives within us. He has taken up His residence in us through His Spirit, so much so that Paul can say, for to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. You see, Christ is so intimately involved in our lives. He lives in us, and it is no longer our lives that we live, but rather it is Christ who lives in us. You say, how, how much is God with me when I evangelize? He is always, always with us as we evangelize. And you see, at the onset of Acts chapter 1, in Acts chapter 1, as Christ commissioned the apostles and the early church to go to be his witnesses, he said in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, that you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. Not only is God with us as we evangelize, but he has equipped us to evangelize. Equipped us in what way, you might ask? How has God equipped us in evangelism? Well, notice here what it says. We will receive power. God, as the Spirit, as the Spirit of God comes and dwells upon us, we will receive power. Power for what? Power to be His witnesses. Power to be His evangelists to the ends of the earth. We will have power, and as it is also translated, boldness. We have boldness now that we did not have before the Spirit came upon us to reside in us at our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. We have boldness we have boldness to proclaim the gospel message, knowing that God is with us. And this is what we see the Apostle Paul and also Barnabas doing in Acts chapter 14, verse 3. It says, as they remained there for a long time, they spoke boldly for the Lord. They spoke boldly for the Lord. I don't know about you, but if I know that God is with me, I am more willing to speak boldly for his name, knowing that he is right there with me as I proclaim the gospel message of his son, our Lord Jesus Christ. This is evident for me in the fact that I have three children myself, three children that I am a father to, and if you know them, if you've ever tried to talk to them, you know they're, they're somewhat timid if you go up to talk to them by yourself. But if I am with them and you go and talk to them, they're more bold in being able to talk to you. They're going to say something to you if their dad is right there with them, you know, protecting them, making sure that they're going to be safe as they talk to this individual. It's the same thing. It's the same principle. The same idea is on display. Our Father is with us as we are taking the gospel message, and we ought to be bold witnesses knowing that he is right there with us. You see, how wonderful of a truth is this? How wonderful of a truth this is to know that our God, who has promised to never leave us nor forsake us, is with us as we evangelize, as we take the gospel message to the ends of the earth. You say, how wonderful is it? This was such a wonderful truth that it was this truth that moved Paul and Barnabas forward in spite of the opposition and the burnout that they might have faced continuing to share the gospel message. Another example of the wonderful, wonderful truth that is to be told to us and the fact that God is with us is from another missionary. 
missionary by the name of John Patton. And John Patton was a missionary who served the Lord in the New Hebrides Islands for many years. And it was early on in his service to the Lord that his wife, his wife died during childbirth. And a few weeks after that, 17 days later, after his wife died during childbirth, his uh, son also, or his child also died. And he found himself on that island in the New Hebrides Islands alone. He had once gone with his wife and his pregnant wife at that point, and now he found himself on that island seeking to share the gospel message with a number of people he did not know, people he had never met, a language in which he did not speak. He found himself one day having to dig the grave of both his wife and his newborn child and having to bury up his wife and newborn child and to sit there on that island knowing that God had called him to those people to share the gospel message in that region that he was in. How would he continue? How would a man who has lost everything continue to share the gospel? To not say, well, you know, I tried my best and I'm just going to go on back home. I might get into a new field, a new career life. You know, I might go ahead and do this. Or, or, or maybe I should continue in the call that God has called upon my life to do. How would a man like this continue? Well, he writes in his memoirs this, He says, he was not altogether forsaking, saying, the ever-merciful God sustained me to lay the precious dust of my loved ones in the same quiet grave. But for Jesus and the fellowship he offered me there, I would have gone mad and died beside that lonely grave. But Jesus was there, and he gave me boldness to continue witnessing for his name. You see, the fact that Jesus was there moved him forward. And the same truth is readily available for us as well because we serve the same God that Paul and Barnabas served and the same God that John Patton served. If we take this truth with us, that God will be with us as we evangelize, he will move us forward in spite, in spite of what might come our way. Now, the second antidote to prevent any burnout that might come as we evangelize is shown to us in verse 7. And while it's not stated explicitly, it is implied in the work that they are doing. Now we read, it says, and there, this is as they went to Lystra and Derby, they continued to preach the gospel message. Now, you say, well, what does this have to do with an antidote to continue to share the gospel message? All it says is they continued to share the gospel message. Well, it is in their actions that we learn a very valuable truth that they took hold of in their life. And this truth, this truth moved them forward. You see, Paul and Barnabas knew that God had entrusted to them his gospel to proclaim to the ends of the earth. They saw it as their highest calling to proclaim the good news of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so, any any opposition that they might have faced, any rejection that they might have faced was readily done away with as they were reminded of the fact that God had entrusted them with his word to take it to the ends of the earth. You see, they were both convinced of the call that God had given to them to be his witnesses. In this area, in any area that they were, they were so convinced that wherever they went, all that they sought to do was to share the gospel message of the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, they were entrusted with it. They were ambassadors. They were ambassadors of this message that God had given to them. And who were they to think that they had anything else to share other than what the creator of the world had given to them? They knew. They knew that their life was not their own. They knew that God was with them and and commissioning them to take the gospel to the ends of the earth. And so, as they had been entrusted, they moved forward as God's faithful witnesses. You see, as we take hold of this truth in our own life, we will be more readily available and willing to share the gospel message. Think about this. Think about this fact. God has entrusted you with His Word. God, the creator of the universe, the one in whom you were separated from because of your sins done against Him, your rebellion against Him, has now called you to himself and has called on you to take the word in which he had given to the world, the word in which brings life, life to anyone who calls on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ to be saved. God has given you, given you the opportunity to serve him in such a wonderful way as sharing his gospel message. You see, as Paul and Barnabas move forward with sharing the gospel message, knowing that they had been entrusted with it, they not only saw it as their highest calling, but also if someone was opposed to it or if someone said, well, maybe you should switch your message up a little bit, they could say, yeah, don't think I want to do that. And the reason they don't want to do that is because it is not their message that they are proclaiming, but rather it is God's message, and he had entrusted them to proclaim it. You see, having this message means there's nothing else to talk about. 
nothing else to talk about. Having this message means that we have nothing better to say. And why is this the case? Well, because with this message, we have the word that all of humanity needs, the word in which all humanity needs, the word of reconciliation, which will bring man out of their enmity against God and bring them into fellowship with God as they call on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ to be saved. Now, I want us to note this. I want us to understand this point because Paul, as Paul was going to share the gospel message, he had a number of things that he could have talked about. Paul had a number of things that he could have talked about. He was a Jew. He was a Jew who was trained under the wise teacher of his day, Gamaliel. He knew all of the works of the law. He knew the law, front, back, page, every, every iota of the law. Paul was zealous for the law. Paul could have spoken all that he could have wanted to about the law as he entered into these towns. He had every opportunity to do so, as we know that he always would go into the synagogue first. And what would you hear at the synagogue? They would be reading from the law and from the prophets and from the writings, which is the Psalms. And so Paul, if he wanted to, if he wanted to avoid the opposition that might come, he could have just said, well, I'm going to engage in a a, a diatribe of the law with these individuals, and I'm going to show them of the knowledge that I have concerning God's law. He could have had a great debate about it with them. He could have assimilated himself to their needs and said, well, they want me to talk about the law, so that's what I'll talk about with them. I'll just talk with them about the law. But you see, God had not called Paul to preach the law. God had called Paul to preach the gospel. And so why would Paul waste his time preaching the law if God had commissioned him to preach the gospel? The same call is for us as well, too. We may not be able to talk about the law, but we can talk about a number of different things, uh, can we not? We can talk about a number of things. We can talk people's ears off about sports or about what we've seen on television or about what we might have, uh, have eaten the night before, but God hasn't called us to talk about those things. God has called for us to proclaim His gospel. We leave those other things for other people to talk about. We talk about the gospel message. Now, not only could Paul have talked about the law, he could have also talked about the matters that the Greeks would have been really familiar with, that the Greeks would have been really concerned about, namely philosophy. Paul himself was a Hellenistic Jew, and so not only did he know the law, but he also knew a great amount of philosophy. He even quotes some philosophers later on in Acts as he goes to the people of Athens. Paul could have talked philosophy. He could have talked about the matters of uh, the philosophy of the mind or of the spirit or of the heart. He could have talked about the innermost wonderings that man has often sought to understand. He could have done all of that. And you can bet that the Greeks or the Gentiles would have eaten it up. They would have loved to discuss the matters of philosophy with him. But again, Paul had not been called to preach philosophy. Paul had been called to preach the gospel. Now, why do I mention this? Why do I mention this temptation that we ourselves can have to preach things that are, that are not the gospel? Well, because if Paul would have went into these towns and preached the law or if he would have preached philosophy, you can bet he would have never faced persecution, never would have faced persecution. They may have you know, disagreed with him a little bit, but they would never have beaten him. They would never have sought to stone him. They would, he would never have been beheaded some 20 years after this account here by the evil emperor Nero. Paul, if he just wanted to talk about the law, and about philosophy, he would have made a number of friends. He wouldn't have had very many, very, he would have had very few enemies. He just would have lived his life and he would have built a great following to himself. But again, he had not been called to preach the philosophy of his day, nor had he been called to preach the matters of the law. He had been called to preach the gospel, and so it is for us. Again, we can avoid persecution. We can avoid persecution. We can compromise on the message. We can speak about sports or about the things in which people want to hear about in our day, or we can be faithful to the call that God has given to us, and that is to preach the gospel. Now, the way in which we will do this if we, is if we realize that God has entrusted us to do this. God has entrusted us to preach his message. And since God is our Lord, we will submit ourselves to his will for our lives, which is to proclaim his word and his word alone. I want us to notice what Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 2. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 2, you say, what did Paul preach? What did Paul preach wherever he went? He says, for I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. Nothing more, nothing less, but Jesus Christ and him crucified. 
crucified. Think about this for a moment here, church. Think, think about what Paul is saying here. Paul, a man who could have spoken about the matters of the law, about the matters of philosophy, could have made a good life out of this. He could have made a lot of money out of this. He could have had all of the successes that the world would have offered to him in being able to preach the law and to preach philosophy. But he says, now, don't need to do any of that. I resolve to preach nothing more and nothing less but Christ and him crucified. You see, Paul was not called to preach the words of wisdom of man, but rather the wisdom of God. The wisdom of God which saves man from their enmity against them, saves man from the wrath of God and brings them into everlasting life. You see, he doesn't need to preach a works-based righteousness. He doesn't need to preach philosophy of his day, but rather he preaches the gospel, which alone has the power to save. And despite the opposition he faced, despite the beatings that he took, he would keep on preaching the matters of the gospel. And we'll see this all throughout the book of Acts. And in his letters, he constantly reminds the readers of the church and also the people in the cities that he goes to that he is going to preach the gospel message. And why was it that he was so willing to do this? Well, I believe it is because he knew that God was with him, and he knew also that he had been entrusted to preach the gospel message. And church, when we take hold of this truth, when we take hold of this truth, we will do the same. We will do the same. There will be no burnout in evangelism. There will be no fear of man in evangelism because we know that God is with us, and he, he has entrusted us to preach his word. Think about this for a second here, church. What is it that the world most needs to hear today? What does the world need to hear today? Or think about it this way. What do you need to hear today? What does man, yes, amen, they need to hear the gospel message. They don't need to hear anything else. They have enough information going into their mind. A number of different things are being funneled into their mind today when all that they really need to hear is the gospel message. You see, today in our society today, there are a number of different ideas about how to bring about this utopia that all mankind is seeking. We're seeking world peace. We're seeking freedom from hunger. We're seeking a freedom from, from all of the wickedness and the evil that is in our world today that is done through the hands of Satan. The world is seeking answers. And you can bet that a number of different people have options for them to respond to. You have those who say, well, in order to unite humanity... And to get rid of any opposition in the world, well, all that we need to do is educate everyone in the world. And if everyone is educated, then the problems will cease to exist. But we know that that doesn't need, that that's not going to happen. America is one of the most educated countries in the world. And how much opposition do we have? It's constant. That's all you see in the world today. Education does not produce change. Education does not solve the problems that man has at its core, namely sin. On top of this, you would say, well, in order to uh, prevent the disunity that we see in the world today, Today, we need to eradicate the systems that seek to perpetuate it. Get rid of the world systems of the day that, that seek to perpetuate disunity. Again, a good idea to some, but this is not going to work. Still so also you have some, well, in order to solve world hunger, and in order to bring about world peace, tax the rich, make them give their money to these people, and if everyone has equal living, equal salaries, equal bank accounts, then everything is going to be perfect. That is the message of the world today, but you know what is the truth about all of these messages? They do not work. In fact, they cannot work because they do not solve the biggest problem that all man has in the world today, and that is the problem of sin. All of us, all mankind is plagued by sin. Now, if you are in Christ, you have been set free from the penalty of sins. But as it is for the rest of the world, the world is plagued under their sin. They stand under the just condemnation of God where one day God will punish them eternally for their sins. But here and now... They have an opportunity to be reconciled to God. And though this will not bring about world peace in our day right now, one day Christ will come and he will draw all worshipers to himself, eradicate all of the evil systems of this world, and he will bring true worshipers unto himself. That is the message that we have to proclaim, namely salvation by grace through faith in Christ. And if they respond to him in faith, they shall be saved. What else is there to say to people today? There is nothing, there is nothing greater than the gospel message of the Lord Jesus Christ. And this was the case in Paul's day. This was the case, this is the case in our day, and this will be the case until the Lord our God draws people to himself and to his eternal glory. And so what then are we to do now? What then are we to do now? 
we must recognize that we have been entrusted with the most important message that the world will ever hear. And in spite of the opposition, in spite of the burnout that might come from constantly facing the same pressures of, of, of the reality of evangelism each day, we will continue to proclaim. We must continue to proclaim it. And if, and if we do, and if we do this, we know, we know that on that final day, we will be brought into the glory of our great God where he will not only tell us, well done, our good, my good and faithful servant, but also we will see people in glory with us that we have led to Christ. We will see people in glory that we have led to Christ, and we will join with them in worship, in worship of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Don't you want that, church? Don't you want that for your life? Don't you think that God desires that he would draw worshipers unto himself? And don't you realize that God has chosen you to be one of his witnesses, to be entrusted with his gospel, to draw worshipers unto him and him alone? If we grasp this truth, we will be a church that takes the gospel message in spite of what might come our way. Church, let us pray. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for this day, this, this wonderful day that we have been able to have to open your word and to be able to consider this wonderful truth of the fact that you are with us, God, in evangelism. How wonderful, how wonderful of a truth that is. God, we know that you are with us now, and, and we know that you are with us for all time, for all of eternity, but God, help us to really grasp this truth as we are out in evangelism as we are doing the mental gymnastics in our minds or as we are uh, seeking to think about who it is we should share the gospel message to, God, remind us, remind us, convict our hearts of this truth that you are with us and lead us with that truth to be able to realize that as you are with us, you have entrusted us with your great word. And, and God, we pray for the wisdom and the boldness to be able to proclaim, to proclaim your word to the people in whom you place in our paths. God, we, we desire this. God, we long for this. And we know that as you are faithful to keep your promises, Lord, we, we, we know that you will lead us into all boldness to proclaim your truth today. It's in Christ's name I pray these things. Amen.